Greetings, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I'm very uh, happy that you endured through the all the three days of sessions, and you, even that you postponed your cervezas and uh, sangrias till later. So today, I would like to uh, present uh, a bit uh, reverse stories story that you all did today. So I would like to present a story which is from bottom up. Uh, road uh, that has risen from bottom up and this also part of my story so in first I mean the reason why is because I live in the uh, area where those uh, pile buildings were uh, basically five minutes away from my house and uh, yeah I'm all through uh, interested uh, in pile dwellings from the childhood so my talk will be set, uh, separated in three points. So how the, from local heritage to uh, old heritage. So basically how the story through, uh, yeah, basically uh, 100, 140 years more uh, developed and how did, they, did it connect it with the uh, identity. Then the second point will be uh, the identity carriers and uh, if the prehistoric sites can be that. And the last point will be the archaeology and well, creation of cultural heritage. Oops. So, the, about pile dwellings you've heard today quite a lot, so I will just skip uh, what they are and uh, go directly on the well, the year of when they were uh, first time discovered in Slovenia, that was uh, the case of Karl Dejman. So that was the time that uh, people basically uh, received that information of the big size of excavations with a romantic approach. So this is one of the uh, paintings from Naturhistorisches Museum. There are many others that exist uh, throughout the Alps. And uh, this concretely is a picture from, uh, from Ip, from that area that I will describe later. And that is, uh, funny enough, Expo in Paris, um, 1878. And uh, this is the Statue of Liberty, at least its head, that later traveled to New York. But behind it, it's uh, uh, basically a location where all those, uh, those uh, findings were found. So basically, even at the earlier stage, it was uh, connected, uh, this uh, identity with uh, those early findings. So the next point I would like to stress is that uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, there were a lot of excavations also connected with Padwanis. And at that time, there was a book published, which is Givers. But what's important is that later on became uh, mandatory uh, literature for the school children in Slovenia. Why am I saying this? Is because this is the something that really uh, synced in uh, the whole Slovenian well, identity, I would say because everyone knows about this heritage. And uh, we are still uh, very local. So this is uh, the theater play inspired by, uh, by that book and it's also the romantic uh, view. And uh, this is basically a pop-up theater that happened in the 50s, 60s as a consequence of another excavation at that time. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is a clear correlation with uh, archaeological excavations and then the reaction of the local society. And uh, here there is a shift. So basically, uh, this archaeologist, uh, Jan Bregant, invited uh, locals to participate with the excavations. So at that time, uh, basically, everyone was either visiting the sites or participating. So this guy later uh, became our archaeologist in the Institute of Archaeology. 
<clears throat> and uh, we are now, <clears throat> well, almost in the present, uh, where also my story begins. So uh, there is uh, an association, local association, and basically what, uh, well, we were um, motivated by, by the interdisciplinary excavations of uh, Anton Belushchuk. And basically together we created uh, something, let's say, a brand or some idea like uh, the, in the land of pile dwellers. And uh, now this association is basically a, a motor that drives uh, the identity creation or let's say heritage creation and uh, they have uh, a small exhibition, permanent one, and then lots of different uh, uh, workshops um, and uh, basically the um, guided tours. And what's uh, most important is that everyone comes together in events like uh, Unwellings Day, where we invite also um, uh, basically all the uh, interested public that is uh, involved in heritage. That means that uh, not only a state, uh, state uh, uh, institutes are involved, but also uh, local population and craftsmen, so basically all that they feel uh, somehow connected with this heritage. And now I'm just trying to uh, expand on wha what is the role of this uh, uh, NGO uh, in creating the local identity. Now we are, I must uh, remind you, now we are still pre-UNESCO inscription. So <coughs> basically that uh, NGO uh, was uh, was basically uh, creating a, well, a huge, uh, mm, let's say, motivation that uh, later on uh, resulted in, uh, yeah, basically uh, resulted in uh, widespread uh, identification effect, I would say. And uh, basically, later on, of course, uh, this association come, came to some challenges. And what were, uh, they were basically limited to funding and the lack of permanent, uh, let's say, continuity. So basically, lots of people were uh, fluctuating uh, and so uh, basically just the few of them la stayed and carried this on. And uh, my uh, observation was that uh, overcoming these challenges was spread basically um, if the associations or NGOs would be professionalized, so at least one person would be employed and took over this um, basically interpretation of the heritage and uh, taking care of all the dirty small business, uh, then this community would be much stronger together. And uh, what this, uh, what I'm proposing here is that such NGOs should focus in uh, basically that such, uh, section of the population. So if we imagine that uh, these are the, uh, let's say, curators or the ones who are generating this event, and that are the direct contacts of them, so friends, families, this is the first uh, wave or, let's say, first part of the uh, society that is not directly connected to those uh, uh, society, uh, association. And those are the ones who are then taking the interest of the wider one. So let's say they're the pioneers of the hip, so to say. And then after that, uh, it can go much, uh, much faster. So basically just to uh, 
come to this uh, 2011. Uh, so we, you've seen this uh, slide already. So this is something that changed dramatically in the view of local perception of this association. So basically now we are inviting, or let's say, uh, the association is inviting international partners. So from Austria, Italy, uh, and basically from everywhere. Uh, and uh, this is again a regatta. I guess uh, we are all uh, very much uh, impressed by the results. And uh, UNESCO designation, I mean, uh, inscription also brought some. Uh, let's say, <clears throat> some political motivation to support this local society or yeah, municipality. So basically next year there is going to be a big visitor center, a project started, started uh, to build and uh, it would be one of those places that would then uh, interpret also this broader picture of the not only one location out of 111, but also others. And that is, for me, a very important point. Uh, because right now, it is just an idea which is not tangible. And this is one of my favorite uh, uh, definitions of heritage. So basically, it's uh, not just physical entity, but also a source of information, knowledge, and a carrier of personal and shared identity. This is uh, one of the... Um, European Heritage Networks, which I strongly recommend to look at uh, their publications. And uh, opposing to what uh, Stella presented before, I'm suggesting that at least in uh, our case, so in the case of Wild Wellings, uh, there is some political neutrality, I mean, at least today, because uh, Together, that in this platform that is basically 130 institutions involved, there is enough uh, resources, so human power, to uh, basically create a common heritage uh, with uh, smaller parts. Well, now just uh, quickly <laughs> through the role of heritage expert that I. Uh, thought it would be interesting for you to hear is that uh, we need to know that uh, heritage values and meaning are not defined only by heritage workers but also associations like I just showed and then uh, that we should uh, try to uh, open up possibilities that uh, heritage is interpreted uh, and uh, presented and uh, at last, I think it's uh, connecting the local heritage with the world heritage is one of the leading roles of uh, management bodies like we are, uh, like us. Uh, so basically, we are fostering some, uh, some kind of uh, shared identity, which is not easily seen if you are living in a small village all your life. And as a conclusion, I would like to uh, say that uh, archaeological research can be an inspiration for uh, creative works like uh, we've seen that uh, carried out from the uh, early starts, so from the beginnings, and uh, basically can and is uh, uh, fueling the local identity. And uh, second, that prehistoric sites are, can be uh, identity carriers for personal and shared identities. Thirdly, that uh, common identity is uh, it's very important that it's uh, strengthened and uh, in the local societies, like one of the many has to be contextualized and that is in my view, role of the uh, cultural workers or heritage workers. And uh, yeah, oops. 
And that is one of the two points that, that maybe we could discuss because we discussed this uh, with colleagues already yesterday. So can the values of this one group become a heritage without uh, intervention of an expert? Uh, and the second, uh, does creativity inspired by heritage um, change its heritage itself? So, thank you a lot.